Tonight, Winnipeg police lay murder charges in the deaths of three Indigenous women. So I have connection to the three women that were identified today. It's a really, really sad day. That's three more charges against an alleged serial killer. Followed by hints and allegations, William and Kate compete for attention on their big U.S. visit. She said, what's your nationality? And I said, lady, I was born here, I'm British. Their team, Dunn and Qatar, Canadian fans look four years ahead to hosting the world. I hope they got a lot of experience out of this. This is The National with Chief Correspondent Adrian Arsenault. Thank you for being with us. It has happened too many times in too many communities across this country. Families and friends of Indigenous women mourning the killing of loved ones. It's happening again tonight at a vigil in Winnipeg after police announced three more murder charges against a man already accused of killing one woman. Police believe all four women were Indigenous and were killed between March and May. One has yet to be identified and police are asking the public for help. The accused, 35-year-old Jeremy Skabicki, was first charged in May. Now for the families of those women, today confirmed their worst fears. Cam McIntosh looks into the charges and the angry calls for change. Sorrow for four slain women and anger at what appears to be targeted killings, including Cambria Harris's mother, Morgan. I think it's sad that time and time again that we have to keep coming here to gather for sad circumstances like this when our family members go missing. There were four women found, and those women had families. They were mothers, they were cousins, sisters, and they didn't deserve that. Morgan Harris, Mercedes Myron, Rebecca Contois, and a fourth woman police say they can't yet identify. The last thing that we want is for this fourth victim to remain a Jane Doe. It's always unsettling when there's a, any kind of a serial killing. Jeremy Anthony Michael Skabicki faces four counts of first-degree murder. First charged and detained in May after police recovered Contois' remains. Now, even though they have not found the remains of the other women, police say DNA evidence links Skibiki to the deaths of Harris, Myron, and the unknown woman, all killed between March and May. We're of the belief with the information we have right now that Skibiki acted alone. Move it over this way a little bit more. For months, there have been community searches for Myron and Harris. Recently, we talked to Myron's grandmother, putting up missing posters. It's scary. We just want to find her alive. Myron and Harris both came from Long Plain First Nation, not far from Winnipeg. Right now, it's just really trying to figure out how we can come together um, to support each other. Chief Kyra Wilson is also related to Contois. She was also a part of my extended family. So I have connection to the three women that were identified today. And it's just, um, it's a really, really sad day. And an angry day with renewed calls for protections for Indigenous women. Not a day goes by that we don't ask for that. And today is why. Others want to see this treated as a hate crime, saying the problem of targeted violence is bigger than one man. It hasn't made the city any safer by him being off the street because women have still gone missing and murdered since the time he's been incarcerated. Meanwhile, from Winnipeg's new mayor, acknowledgement Indigenous women are being failed. As a citizen, uh, I, I cannot accept that. And as a city, we must not accept that. We need to do more. Here in Manitoba, politicians of all stripes have been saying that for a very long time with little progress. They have indeed, Cam. Do we know anything else about the fourth victim, uh, victim or, or whether there might actually be others? Well, the police today did release a photograph of a jacket they believe belonged to that fourth unnamed victim who they actually believe was killed first. They're asking anyone that recognizes that jacket in that photo to get in touch with police with any information they may have. As for the question of whether there could be more victims, I put that to the police in the news conference today. They say right now their evidence is pointing just to these four victims. All right, Cam McIntosh in Winnipeg, thank you. Let's bring in someone with deep roots in the community. First, as a storyteller and as a former Grand Chief, Sheila North. 
Sheila, thank you for being with us. This is, this is really tough. You have been a stalwart in your community. And as someone who's been telling the stories of missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls, what, what is happening in your mind on a night like this? Well, it doesn't get any easier every time you hear it. It actually brings you back to the same feelings and emotions the first time you hear it and the first time you understand the magnitude of what happened. And it brought me back to that very same place today, this afternoon when I heard and it stopped me in my tracks and my heart is broken and I can't imagine how the families are feeling. No, oh, I know, I hear that. You know, there, there's so much, Sheila, that we don't know about what happened here, but from all the work in the inquiry into missing, murdered Indigenous women and girls, there are strong recommendations, and I'm curious what you think has not been addressed. Well, I think that there's been a great effort, and I know many great people that are involved in trying to have an implementation effort and uh, trying to, you know, make sure that these calls to justice are being implemented. Um, and, and I applaud the efforts on that, but we're not seeing some very, very important steps, immediate steps that, and one of them including um, supporting in any single and every opportunity we can to uphold and uh, um, honor Indigenous women by providing the necessary resources they need to be self-sufficient and that's proper education lift them out of poverty child care and uh, you know jobs and training our, our women are dying literally on our streets because of the lack of of respect that they have in their own country and we all can do something about it to about it right now just the basics eh? just the core basics Sheila thank you for spending time with us we will talk again Thank you very much, I could say. If you're affected by this or other cases of missing and murdered Indigenous women, support is available. You can reach a free crisis line at this number. It is 1-844-413-6649. The artist formerly known as Kanye West may now be the most famous anti-Semite in the United States. On a live stream, the 22-time Grammy award-winning rapper left no room for doubt publicly praising the Nazis and denying the Holocaust. As Katie Simpson shows us, this is reinforcing fears that such hate is going mainstream. But this guy Conspiracy that theorist Alex invented Jones invented invited Kanye invented West onto his program. He's the one with the covered face. And the conversation was as offensive and harmful as you might expect. You're not a Nazi. You don't deserve to be called that and demonized. I see good things about Hitler also. West has been saying and posting things like that for months. I want this country to Recently, he brought a well-known white supremacist and Holocaust denier to dinner with Donald Trump, which the Republican candidate for president has refused to clearly denounce. It boggles the mind. You, I just can't. It is almost hard to understand that this is happening in 2022. Advocates are sounding it, the alarm that anti-Semitism in the U.S. is becoming mainstream. The Anti-Defamation League has found acts of hate have been rising steadily. Last year, it tracked 2,717 anti-Semitic incidents throughout the United States, making it the highest number on record since ADL began tracking anti-Semitic incidents in 1979. We're definitely on track to be probably around what 2021 was, possibly even higher. Um, it has certainly not gone down. Would you say there's been a normalization of anti-Semitism? Not only normalizing it, but also the fact that increasingly it's become socially acceptable. Dr. Peter Hotez requires security when speaking in public. As a vaccine developer, he's been inundated with anti-Semitic threats based on COVID conspiracy theories that try to blame the Jewish community for the pandemic. People need to understand why anti-Semitic rhetoric and anti-Semitic targeting is so dangerous and, the, and its legacy, of course, with the most dramatic version being being what, what happened in the Holocaust. In its latest domestic threat assessment, the Department of Homeland Security says the Jewish community is among several groups at risk of being targeted. The U.S. will remain in a heightened threat environment until at least next May. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Washington. French President Emmanuel Macron raised the issue of the rise of extremist ideologies during his first state visit to the U.S. since Joe Biden took office. And we see in our countries, almost everywhere, 
a sort of resurgence of hatred speech, racism, divisions. Macron thanked the current U.S. administration for fighting the trend. Macron and Biden talked about a number of economic and security related issues, including the war in Ukraine. Thank you. Now, tonight, accusations of racism are swirling around the royal family, threatening to overshadow William and Kate's trip to Boston. Chris Reyes takes us through the hints and allegations from the UK to the US. The cheers from the crowd make it clear. In Boston, the Prince and Princess of Wales have fans. All welcome, all warmth. Very different from the serious tone in a statement from the Prince's spokesperson. Racism has no place in our society. The comments were unacceptable, and it is right that the individual has stepped aside with immediate effect. That was about his 83-year-old godmother, Lady Susan Hussey, who resigned as a royal aide after she allegedly directed racist comments against a guest at the palace, women's advocate Ngozi Fulani. What's your nationality? And I said, lady, I was born here, I'm British. I'm not going to beat about the bush. It was traumatic, it's a horrible experience. On top of that, a new video from Prince Harry and Meghan, teasing their upcoming Netflix docu-series. Both have spoken out about racism within the monarchy in the past. When the stakes are this high, doesn't it make more sense to hear our story from us? In the trailer, this shot, reflecting the apparent divide between the couples who aren't expected to meet on this visit. All that family drama, not a concern for fans in Boston. I was happy to see that William addressed it. And he kind of nipped it in the bud and said, we're not, we're not taking that here. That's not what we represent. That's not what we stand for. You know, they're two different people compared to whoever made the comments. So I don't really, I just look at them. If it came from them, then I would have kind of like seen a little different. But I have seen them based on news. They don't seem to me to be such a racist people. Friday is the final day of the couple's visit. They'll meet with U.S. President Joe Biden before hosting a gala for the prince's charity, the Earthshot Prize. Chris Reyes, CBC News, Boston. Well, Canada's trip to the Men's World Cup is over for now. The team lost its final group stage match today. But as Thomas Degla shows us, everyone's sights are already set on what comes next, 2026. Let's go, Canada! Woo! Think of it as a peek into Canada's soccer future. Glory on the biggest stage is out of reach for now, but fans are still eager to cheer. It's history. Yeah, we've, we've been a part of history. It gives hope for the next generation as well. Canada. Miriam McDuff hopes her son, Anderson Arthur, will see Canada reach new heights in his lifetime. From the time we were qualifying all the matches, you, when I was pregnant, we were there, and now he's here, six months old. From kickoff, fans watched the mighty Moroccans take it to Canada. Goalkeeper Milan Borian accidentally gave away the ball and a goal in just the fourth minute. Then the Moroccans struck again. Canada's Sam Adekupe responded with a shot deflected by a Moroccan player, allowing Canada to score. There were agonizingly close calls for Canada, but in the end, Morocco won 2-1. to one. How do you feel? Um, very disappointed. For Canada's supporters and the team itself, it's time to go home. Earlier than they'd hoped, with only losses. Against three of the best teams in the world, like, they did their best and we're, we're happy for them. I hope they got a lot of experience out of this. With several promising young players, the squad expects its best days are ahead of them. And what about head coach John Herdman? You'll not find anyone as passionate as, as I am about this program. After elevating Canada's women and men, he may now be fielding new offers from abroad. Will John Herdman be head coach at the World Cup in 2026? He will. He will. Yeah. You can guarantee that? Well, I can guarantee that I want John to be the head coach of 2026. In less than four years, Canada gets an added advantage with the Men's World Cup coming home. Thomas Dagg, CBC News, Doha. So a win today still wouldn't have been enough for Canada to advance, but just being on that pitch, on that world stage, is enough to spark all kinds of excitement here at home. And as Susanna De Silva shows us, to give the whole sport here a boost. 
even though Canada's World Cup fate was already decided, we're at number 19, Alfonso Today was still a chance to celebrate. Fun? Yeah. Super exciting. I feel like this is like a big moment in Canada history. This school made it into a month-long event. The last couple years has been tough on the kids, so giving them anything to celebrate, using the World Cup as a way to engage them. Before, I didn't really think soccer was like something to do. Like, I didn't think soccer would be that fun. Elsewhere in the country, while the parties were a little more muted, that spark for the game remained. I wanted to come support my boys. 17-year-old Matthew Turpin was first in line at 6 a.m. Hopefully I can make their it to one or be a player in one suit. It's a wonderful time for the game in the country, probably the best in its history. This former Team Canada player says it's a good time for young players with a dream. And I look at the opportunities now for boys and girls and, and the exposure that the players can get. 10, 15 years ago, to make it professionally in Canada, it was one of those things where it was Europe or you're done. And now you have the likes of League One BC, League One Ontario, providing all these different stepping stones for these young players. And the added World Cup inspiration is already translated leading to the pitch. 10-year-old Jeffrey Zhao begged his dad for this extra playing time. Well, I can notice him start to want to train more, and he just recovered from a flu, but he cannot wait at home. And he says he cannot wait to one day don the maple leaf. I try to improve more and harder and like practice harder so then I can one day play for Canada. Big dreams and some new valuable role models. Susanna Da Silva, CBC News, Vancouver. The federal government has officially launched its dental care program, which it estimates will help up to half a million children. As parents, we recognize that dental care is an essential part of children's health and well-being. Parents can apply with the Canada Revenue Agency to receive the benefit. It's open to children under the age of 12 who do not have private coverage and whose families earn less than $90,000 per year. As the real estate slowdown continues in major centres like Toronto and Vancouver, Calgary is on track to set a record this year. Even though home sales dipped last month, prices are up 8.6% compared to this time last year. A typical home in Calgary now costs $520,000. But that's well below the national average, and one reason why Calgary is attracting a lot of attention from out-of-province landlords. Paula Duhatchek shows us that in the race to cash in, some locals could be priced out. These days, condo sales are strong for this Calgary home builder, though not all of them are coming from inside the city. I would say that 70% of our sales have been GTA-based. They are looking for other markets other than Toronto. This Calgary realtor has also seen a spike in buyers from outside the province. Spring of 2022, I felt like we were having like planefuls of people coming from Ontario to invest in Alberta. Some sales are for people moving to Calgary, but others are scooping up investment properties they can rent out. Prices in Toronto and, and those other cities are completely out of reach, not just for end users, but for investors as well. But it's not just low prices. It could also be the lack of rent control. The tenancy laws really favor landlords uh, to a much greater extent than, than elsewhere in Canada. So it's pretty favorable at the moment for people in other parts of Canada, especially in, in uh, Toronto, uh, to be investing in, uh, in, in Calgary real estate. There's so much interest, real estate agents outside the province are scrambling to get licensed here. Last year, there were 170 applications. This year, there were nearly 600. All of this puts pressure on buyers who actually live in Calgary. There's always concern among the locals, especially existing homeowners and, and people that are trying to get in the market for the first time that, you know, this is the prices are being driven up um, by by this investment. Others see a silver lining. For the most part, I think that it's a welcome sort of uh, addition to our marketplace because we absolutely need more supply of rental properties. With interest rates on the rise and winter setting in, the trend has cooled down, but insiders say as long as people are moving to Calgary, the city will also attract investors hoping to cash in. 
Paula Duhatchik, CBC News, Calgary. A Winnipeg woman is speaking out after Uber drivers refused to give her a ride. He's a guide dog. He's allowed everywhere. And he said, no dogs. We get Uber's response. And Alberta's premier confronts Ottawa with a sovereignty act. And that fight is with an out of control federal government. So what's Ottawa doing? Rosie's here with that issue. But first, a college charges full tuition after a student withdraws due to illness. I was diagnosed with cervical cancer. CBC Marketplace investigates the pressure tactics of one of Canada's largest career colleges. We're back in two. With 14,000 students enrolled every year, CDI College is one of Canada's largest for-profit career colleges. But CBC Marketplace reveals many former CDI students say their quest for higher education came with huge letdowns. Travis Danraj has tonight's investigation. My first thought was, am I going to die in my 20s? Carly Hall received life-altering news while enrolled in CDI College last year. I was diagnosed with cervical cancer. How did it affect your studies? Every time I would open my laptop and start doing something, I would have a minor panic attack. Hall wanted to pause her online studies to undergo treatment. The college said that's not possible. She withdrew but is told she still owes over $19,000 based on the refund policy. To essentially not approve a leave request that seems like legitimate and then to use that as a tuition grab seems pretty uh, unfair to me. We found hundreds of complaints about the college online, about the cost of dropping out and others regarding misleading claims about accreditation, high pressure tactics to enroll and thousands in debt after students withdraw. What kind of employer was CDI? Horrible. Adam Pollock is a former admissions representative turned whistleblower. He says helping students get higher education wasn't the goal. Recruiting and locking in as many as possible was. The targets were minimal two enrollments a week. Okay, so how many calls are you making to try to... A minimal 100 calls a day. What would happen to people who couldn't produce? They'd be fired. Marketplace has been investigating CDI College for months now. We have reached out to CDI multiple times for an interview with CEO Peter Chung or anyone from the college. However, they won't give us one. In the 90s, the state of California sued Chung and others over the operations of a private college Chung opened in that state. The allegations include misleading students. In 2012, Chung denied wrongdoing. For its part, CDI has not addressed the specific findings of CBC's investigation. In statements, they tell us employees may do things the company doesn't condone and say they're aware of issues and are always working to improve. Travis Stanrash, CBC News, Toronto. You can watch Marketplace's full investigation into CDI College tomorrow. That's at 8 p.m. on CBC Gem and CBC Television, 8.30 in Newfoundland. A Winnipeg woman plans to file a human rights complaint after two Uber drivers refused to take her on as a passenger because of her service dog. As Holly Carrick explains, that's not just difficult and degrading, it's also against the law. Okay, ready, boy? Veronica Kanya lost her eyesight at 23. She's relied on her guide dog for years. She takes Apache everywhere. He makes my life just so much better, so much easier. So I feel so much more empowered. But when Kanya ordered an Uber to get to her self-defense class on Sunday, the driver refused to let the dog in the car. He said, no dogs, no dogs. And I explained to him that he's a service dog. He's a guide dog. He's allowed everywhere. And he said, no dogs. The driver drove off and the Uber app dispatched another car. The same thing. He saw the dog. He said, no dog. A third driver finally came and picked her and Apache up. Uber says that's against their policies. Our community guidelines clearly states that drivers cannot deny someone a trip because of their service animal. The company says it's looking into what happened and will take appropriate action, which could mean kicking the drivers from the app. But the incident left Kanya feeling helpless. And weirdly enough, ridiculously enough, embarrassed. This kind of thing happens all the time to guide dog handlers and it needs to stop. Human rights legislation in Manitoba and across Canada prohibits discriminating against somebody who uses a service animal. The law doesn't care if you don't like dogs. The law doesn't care if you don't want fur in your car. Um, just like the law wouldn't care 
uh, if you didn't want to provide service to somebody who was using a walker or a cane. You have to. Kanya says she'll think twice before booking with the service again. I hate to give my business to, you know, someone who, or any company, that's just not following up on their word. Kanya plans to file a human rights complaint so that others like her and Apache don't get left out in the cold. Holly Carrick, CBC News, Winnipeg. And after the break, Rosie's here with that issue. Hey, Rosie. Hi, Adrian. Tonight, we're going to talk about Alberta's Sovereignty Act. Alberta and Canada are both worth fighting for, and that fight is with an out-of-control federal government in Ottawa that sees Alberta and all provinces as its subordinate rather than its partner. What does the act mean for the dynamic between Alberta and Ottawa, and Canada even? And how will the federal government respond? Chantal, Elamine, Althea, and Andrew join me to talk about that. Hi there, I'm Rosemary Barton. Here's what's at issue this week. Alberta and Canada are both worth fighting for, and that fight is with an out-of-control federal government in Ottawa that sees Alberta and all provinces as its subordinate rather than its partner. Danielle Smith has unveiled her Alberta Sovereignty Act. The act empowers the Alberta government to order provincial authorities to refuse to enforce any federal law or policy it believes harmful to the province. The act is already raising questions about its constitutionality. So what is the motive behind Smith's power grab and what's the likelihood of the powers being used? Let's bring in at issue Chantal Bear, Elamine Abdul Mahmoud, Althea Raj, and Andrew Coyne. I know you all have a lot to say about it, so we'll get going right away. Chantal, what, what do you make of uh, this piece of legislation, what it is designed to do? Well, if Justin Trudeau were a bear and someone showed the bear a trap and said, put your head in it, uh, that <laughs> would be what that piece of legislation <laughs> politically is meant to do. Uh, sadly, Justin Trudeau is not a bear. Uh, and politically, the first play here is let's have the federal government take on Alberta so that we can run an election campaign, uh, us versus them. It sounds a bit desperate. That bill is um, so uh, stray so far outside the lines of the Constitution that it has found very little support except for the Saskatchewan Premier, which should tell you something, because if... Um, Anyone in Quebec, the experts on this, had seen anything that worked in this piece of legislation, surely Premier Legault would have found time for it tomorrow, uh, yesterday in his uh, inaugural speech. Andrew, is, is there anything to it, though? I, and I, yes, I've read your column, so I know what your answer will be. But, but is there anything to the idea that, that Danielle Smith feels that her province needs to be better protected? Yeah, I think it's giving her too much credit to say that it's purely a cynical political ploy uh, and that it's only designed to, to engineer competition. I'm sure that's a, an additional side benefit, but I don't think we, do, we should underestimate the degree to which either she or some of the people who advise her actually believe this stuff. I mean, you know, she believes a lot of strange things and it wouldn't be much of a stretch to, to add this to it. Uh, but it's clearly unconstitutional. It clearly involves arrogating to the province uh, powers that it does not have to sit in judgment of federal law to effectively decide which laws it's going to obey and which laws it's not going to, uh, to order, uh, uh, not just to not uh, enforce it, but to order everyone in the broader public sector to basically disobey the law, I guess on pain of being found you know, guilty of obeying the law. Um, it, it's, it's, it's fancy land. Uh, it's got nothing, no basis in constitutional law. So when people are prepared to, to go to that length, it's sometimes because they just want to engineer a confrontation, but sometimes, you know, they actually believe the stuff. Althea, what, what, what do you make of it? Well, I also believe that it's a trap. Um, I think, you know, it, it's, it's, but it's an obvious trap. Like it's so obvious, it's bizarre. The fact that she would even talk about dissolution, like she's like urging, please reporters go ask Justin Trudeau if he's gonna disallow my law because that's what I wanna do. Um, there's like no semblance that this is not about uh, picking a fight with Justin Trudeau. I thought was was most interesting, frankly, was that she seemed completely unprepared for the criticisms about the bill. The fact that this legislation would give cabinet the right to amend laws to enact new laws without going back to the legislature. I mean, this is the type of stuff that 
people who are talking about freedom and government overreach usually cry foul. If you think back in Ottawa, we had a very similar example at the very beginning of the pandemic where the Justin Trudeau's government wanted to give itself the right to tax and spend for more than a year and a half without parliamentary scrutiny. And the Conservatives found this and they said, this is outrageous. And they were right to say this is outrageous and the government backed down. Um, but the fact that she was unprepared for these questions, it really kind of seems like this bill was rather written to be a press release rather than to be a bill that they actually wanted to enact legislation through or that they didn't think people would look that closely. I, I don't know, It's it's that, that part's very strange. Tell me or that they don't really have a very oh. profound understanding of how laws and, and government work. Yeah, LME. Right, I mean, like, that's yeah. the part that stuck out to a lot of people, right? Like the yeah. idea that um, this is the actual legal language that they're putting forward, it seemed at best amateurs and at worst, um, completely, you know, um, lacking understanding of how the constitution works. I think, I think based on that, I think we can deduce that largely it was a piece of political showmanship, right? A, a piece of sort of um, attempting to provoke Justin Trudeau and a, and, a, and a piece of attempting to provoke the federal government to uh, maybe use something like the powers of disallowance to step into this game. But of course, no one is going to take that bait. And so there's got this kind of left uh, explaining a bill that doesn't make a lot of sense. They've already issued a clarification um, based on that point that Althea raised. Um, and, the clar and the clarification seemed to raise more questions than the original bill itself gave. So, so j just for the sake of, of thinking about this, Chantal, what would be the, the risk of this um, being enacted? What, what would be the risk to the country or, or the Constitution or, or the province of Alberta? What, what would happen? I'm not sure that the government that drafted that bill even knows uh, where it goes from there. There are loads of arguments being heard in Alberta, and there is a debate over the federal government's role versus natural resources, mm -hmm. oil and gas. But I don't think that Suncor and Shell are about to take orders from the Alberta government uh, that tells them don't obey a federal law or do not work with the federal government at the time when they're, when they're negotiating funding to transition right. uh, to, to, to the, the targets of the federal government. So you kind of look at that and think the only main result that this will bring to Alberta are divisions. And I believe that bill was drafted so poorly because Alberta is a senior province. It's got a good civil service. There is no way that this government wasn't told how wonky that bill was. Andrew, yeah. Well, that's the thing is, on the one hand, uh, you know, you can't run a federation with, with a province or provinces picking and choosing which laws they're going to obey or enforce within their jurisdiction. That's just um, simply unworkable. It's the yeah. end of federalism if it's spread. But secondly, yes, you're going to have people within Alberta saying, well, actually, we think we will obey the federal law. People within the, the government, within these arms linked agencies that the government's not supposed mm -hmm. to be mm -hmm. running roughshod over, who are going to be put in a position where their lawyers are saying to them, yeah, actually, you do have to obey federal law. And they're being told by the province, we will come after you if you do. Uh, that's what likely to lead to all kinds of internal, basically, chaos. It's going to lead to uncertainty. It's going to drive away anybody thinking of investing in that kind of, of, of anarchy. Uh, So it, 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 it really is a completely unworkable vision of, of, of how you would run either a province or a federation. Do, do, you, do you see any part of it, Althea, that would, that would make sense? I mean, one of, the, one of the pieces of legislation they point to is Bill C-96, which we know Alberta was not happy with. Uh, like, is there any m mechanism there where they could suddenly start to ignore things like that and it would be, I mean, I'm not saying it would be legal, but it would, it would make sense in some ways. Yeah, another example that's given uh, often is the firearms buyback uh, right. program that the federal government enacted. I think the first thing that's going to happen, frankly, is as soon as this bill gets real assent, because I, I would be surprised if the lieutenant governor decided not to give it for Hill assent, yeah. is it's going to be appealed to the courts right away. Like, I think Albertans uh, themselves will choose to challenge this legislation. I think the tougher part, frankly, it's not going to be from Justin Trudeau and Dominic LeBlanc, the intergovernmental affairs minister, who I think will show lots of restraint, but it's from uh, liberal MPs in Ottawa. And like, how do you keep people from keeping their mouth shut for months? Because this is going to escalate if 
Premier Smith wants a fight, and there is an, the government, the federal government doesn't give her one. Yeah. She will just continue to up the ante, right? And that is going to create a lot of pressure here, I think, uh, for people to sit on their hands and not say anything, at least until the election is over. Now, if she wins the spring election, then I think you'll hear a lot more from <laughs> federal sure. government sure. Uh, and other partners. Ellen, me last word on this part to you. It will still mean something. It will still mean something for this bill to be challenged because that will be politically useful for the premier. I think there is a there's a there's a at least a degree to which um, that is politically usable in the next election to say we put forward this uh, this document. Now it is being challenged, but we are the only ones standing up for Alberta. I suspect that that is actually the primary use of this document. It's not meant to actually do. You know, it's not actually meant to enact any specific bills or stop any specific mm -hmm. bills. It is meant to be this piece of, like I said, uh, political showmanship. Yeah, I already saw some of that on Twitter, certainly, between uh, the Premier and Rachel Notley, her, her main opponent uh, today. We're going to take a short break. We'll be back with another round of that issue. The idea that we're sort of going to have a criminal code free zone in Alberta doesn't really make a lot of sense. Some federal response there, but how will Ottawa respond? And what does this say about its relationship with the provinces? That's next on The National. Welcome back to At Issue with Alberta's Sovereignty Act unveiled. How does the federal government plan to respond? Here's the Minister of Intergovernmental Affairs, Dominic LeBlanc. Let's see it work its way through the legislative process in Alberta. And at the right moment, we'll decide if we want to do anything about it. But we think Albertans need to be heard on this particular bill right now. Provinces pushing back. How is the federal government handling this unprecedented power grab? And is the situation part of a bigger problem between the feds and the provinces? Okay, let's bring back at issue Chantal, Elamine, Althea, and Andrew. I, I'm, I, I want to start with you, Chantal. Is, is there something going on here, the beyond Alberta? And, and even if we think this piece of legislation is, is sort of outside of the realm of, of what is possible, um, is there something else going on between Ottawa and the provinces, given this, what's happening in Saskatchewan, the notwithstanding clause? What do, what do you think? There certainly is something with uh, premiers who are not liberals uh, trying to find uh, all kinds of ways uh, to um, evade the Constitution or to use their powers under the Constitution to the hilt. That being said, um, the federal reaction today to the latest uh, out cry on this from Alberta makes a lot of sense in the sense that uh, if you watched what happened to not, the notwithstanding clause debate just a few weeks ago in Ontario yep. over union rights, uh, what happened in Ontario was Ontario public opinion uh, kind of sent the premier and his government scurrying back to say, we didn't mean it and we're not going to do this again. Yep. So it makes more sense to effectively let Alberta have this debate and an election on it uh, before coming out with any kind of uh, a federal orchestrated response. That being said, by the way, the federal government cannot act on a bill. No. It needs a law yeah. to, to act on. So right. there, there is actually, Dominique Leblanc is right, uh, at this point, watching where the dust settles is the best part of valor. So the government obviously can't act, as Chantel said, on a bill, but should they be acting on the frustration that provinces are expressing, Andrew? Well, to some extent, yes, you can always try to phrase things in different ways. You can try to get at the sources of people's frustrations, but you can't necessarily back off on uh, important and necessary federal initiatives just because somebody somewhere yells at you. <laughs> I do think we have to look at the Alberta situation in the context of this more general trend that is partly piggybacking on, uh, on Quebec's willingness to defy the Constitution in various ways, but is also, I think, not coincidental. These are right-wing populist uh, premiers who have imported some of the same kind of attitude towards political norms and, and civilized behavior and are willing to push boundaries that should not be pushed. I'm not sure exactly what you do with it. I agree with that the in the short term that the, the, the federal government is taking the right tone of this uh, and not, uh, not needlessly escalating things. Uh, they don't need to because they can deal with anything through the courts. This is what makes this different from the notwithstanding issue where the right. courts have basically been taken out of the game. So for now, they've got the courts, they can use the courts, they can use the desire of people in the provinces to live in a law-based state, uh, which is true of Albertans as much as anybody else in the country. 
Uh, but there can be situations. This is not going to go away. I think we're, we're in for more trouble in the provincial fund in the future. And there may well be situations in which they do need to make available of things like the disallowance power. And I hope that in Ottawa they're thinking about this and that they're ultimately going to start preparing public opinion for that possibility. Uh, that, that nice, soft words uh, are useful and helpful in a lot of situations, but they're not always enough. Althea, what, what do you think? Is that something they're preparing for? Or, or is, is this government looking to continue to collaborate well, last time I had a conversation with anybody in the PMO about disallowance, it was completely dismissed out of hand, not at all something that they were <laughs> interested uh, in doing, but I don't know, maybe ask them again in a few months. Um, what's really interesting, I think, and this harkens back to Chantal's point, is when the government, the federal government, decides to shut up and when it decides to actually get involved. Um, so when it feels like they uh, have an advantage or that there is no loss, like we saw them uh, very plainly criticize Doug Ford on the notwithstanding clause. But, you know, they kept their mouth shut when it came to the notwithstanding clause on Bill 96 and Bill 21 in Quebec. And they're very restrained right now with uh, Premier Smith. Um, but the reason that Doug Ford decided to back down was because of public outcry, public outcry, the threat of a general strike. And that's the lesson I think that needs, uh, everybody needs to listen to here. It's if you are outraged by what the premier is doing, then, you know, go demonstrate, go make your voice heard. Because if, if you don't, then nobody feels like, the, but, you know, if there's if the public opinion doesn't follow, doesn't matter what we say as talking heads, they will respond to what's popular. And right now they think this is popular and this will help them win the election. And that's what they're doing. Um, and that's why Premier Ford also today decided not to use the notwithstanding clause again when he was asked about uh, a bill with regards to nurse wages. So uh, I think that's the lesson here. Elamy. Uh, I mean, I wonder to an extent you're a member of a for the federal government at this point to just mm -hmm. print out a certificate for every province and say, you know what, you're all nations within a nation and just um, be happy with this kind of record. <laughs> because certainly Saskatchewan is like knocking on the door on the same front at the same, you know, at the same time. Um, but in all seriousness, I think that the idea that in Alberta, um, this move is being opposed by institutions like the Chamber of Commerce is saying this is going to threaten investment in Alberta. Um, the way that we saw labor unions stand up in, in Ontario is uh, one of the lessons I think to four talking heads and pundits like us is that perhaps we overestimate, or at least some of us overestimated the, the depth of a unity crisis in the sense that in all provinces across the country, um, every time that uh, some of these premiers begin to, to say, you know what we want we want you know that the, the recognition that we are a separate thing um there's enough civil and public institutions who are willing to respond and say you know what no not to that extent not to the extent that you are representing it and i'm saying this directly to myself i think i was one of those people who yeah. may have overblown the the extent of a unity crisis in that way Okay, uh, on that note, I'm going to leave it there. Thank you all very much for all your smart thoughts. And I'm going to remind viewers it's, that it's that time of year again when we want to hear from you. So you can send us, well, really them, your political questions about this past year or what you want to know about the year to come. I'll put your best questions to the gang there. You can email us at the CBC, uh, the national at cbc.ca, rather. Or you can message us on Instagram at CBC the National, and we'll put some of those questions to the panelists in the coming weeks. Now, though, it's back to Adrian in Toronto. All right, Rosie, thank you. After the break, a Florida boy goes missing for months, but employees at a New Brunswick Walmart help rescue him. Based on what happened here on October 30th, I found that we had to recognize the employees here at Walmart. Their quick action in our moment. Well, here's a moment that matters. A young Florida boy back in his mother's arms reunited after he went missing for months. So that reunion would not have happened if it wasn't for a group of Walmart employees in New Brunswick who sprung into action after identifying the boy in an Amber Alert hundreds of kilometers from his home. Their quick thinking is our moment. Without their actions, uh, that young boy could still be out there somewhere missing from his family. Two of our customer, they came to me that uh, they have seen uh, a man and a boy who were in the news that the child is abducted. He came to get a SIM card. I had AJ and a customer saying that, can you confirm it? Is that the guy? 
but when I look at the picture of the kid and I was sure that it's definitely that guy. I just had the two associates that came to me um, actually put their backs to the aisle uh, just to make sure that if it was him that we weren't uh, in any way going to scare him off. We notified police and we maintained uh, eye contact throughout uh, to try and deter them while in the store um, while we waited for our CMP. The sense of pride that I have for this team is, is it's just incredible. This is not a normal situation by any means. He was actually delivered to his mother on November 2nd and there's, uh, for anybody who hasn't seen the video, it's worth watching just the, the joy in the family's uh, eyes, but also in the young boys. Good for you, for all those people in Moncton. Well done to you. This little guy was missing for just about two months and when his mom uh, finally saw him, uh, she said she couldn't stop crying. She was so happy she's going to celebrate her birthday and Halloween all at once because they missed them all. That is a national for December the 1st. Thank you for being with us. Have a good night.